Good evening, everyone. Welcome to uh, Thursday, January 23rd, 2014, regular school committee meeting in Arlington. My name is Judd Pierce. I chair this thoughtful and fine committee. Um, before we get started tonight, I'd like to introduce all of you to the new art on our walls here um, from the Dallin School, Stacy Greenland. Uh, directly to our right here, uh, we'll see foam mosaics by fourth grade students. And these fourth grade students looked at traditional Roman mosaics to see how pictures can be conveyed through a number, number of small colored tiles. The concept of mosaics was connected to the idea of squares and grids in the popular game of Minecraft. Many students have made mosaic designs in the creative mode of the game by building on a flat surface with blocks of different colors and textures to create designs such as those. And to our left here, um, observational drawings of nature and shadow. Students looked at the work of Hawaii-based contemporary artist Wayne Zebzda, who creates drawings in a unique way by turning the settings of his blowtorch down very low to create a sooty, uh, a sooty discharge of carbon smoke, which he must constantly move around the paper so his drawing won't catch fire. And they worked on creating drawings with pencil uh, from close observation of natural objects such as shells, pine cones, driftwood, crystals, and seed pods. International Dot Painting Day. Now I'm having a hard time finding where the dot, right there, right behind Mr. Schlickman. This project began as a collaboration between Dallin's librarian, Rebecca Aronson, and art specialist, Stacy Greenland, to celebrate International Dot Day on September 15th, 2013, with all the students at the Dallin. International Dot Day reflects the values expressed in the story of the dot wherein main character Vashti overcomes her insecurities about, about her art and gets bra so bravely creative that she even helps another younger artist get over his own fears. And during the library time, the librarian read The Dot uh, by Massachusetts author and illustrator Peter Reynolds and introduced students to the original artwork signed by the author that are now part of the library's art collection. And then they let their creative juices flow using a temp temporary brush painting an art class. And each student was asked to make his or her own mark and sign it. In just four days, Dallin students made over 800 paintings, exploring dots, mark making, and symbols of all kinds. And right behind the audience, we have monochromatic paintings. Second grade students began by looking at the work of some contemporary artists, such as Joan Mitchell and Christian Schneid, who make monochromatic paintings. They noticed how interesting and diverse paintings could be, even if they used only variations of one color, and then created color scales by mixing a tint and a shade of a pure color. And the scale served as a guide for all the variations of one color that could be used. And right behind the screen, you can't see much of it, but hopefully that screen will go up soon, wire art. And this is designed by students in grades four and five at the Dallin. To get inspiration and ideas, they looked at the wire art of sculptor and musician Tom Kaufman. They noticed that many of the sculptures incorporated movement, and sometimes they looked different from multiple angles. And after a quick demonstration on how to connect the shape wire, students sketched ideas and began exploring with pieces of colored wire. Very excellent artwork from the Dallin tonight. Thank you for gracing our walls. Um, before I get uh, to introduce some special guests to lead off our meeting tonight, I'd like to just say a couple of remarks. Um, the subject is Think Big, New Year, New Strategies. And I'd like to take a moment to look back at the lessons we can learn from the late Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. This was a man who thought big, surely bigger than big. And what he did was not only teach peace and compassion and equality, but also conveyed a practice of nonviolence resistance. He witnessed the brutality in our country, African American men and women subject to the most nightmarish of conditions, and Dr. King observed the plight of our poor and that nothing was being really done to address any of this. He and others in the civil rights movement back then opened our eyes to these atrocities, which white Americans either did not know about or, choose to, or chose to ignore or do nothing about because of fear. And he taught those who were most affected not to fear that to affect change takes a number of people to stand up and say, we are not afraid of you. We can get through anything you put at us because you cannot conquer hate with hate. Only love can do that. This was unbelievable, truly amazing lessons about community and power 
to change things that folks thought could never be changed for the better. And I think Mr. Hainer was around back then. So <laughs> maybe he can address some of this firsthand. The holiday on Monday was important, folks. It's not only a day off from school and work. We must always have at least this one day to reflect on Mr. Uh, Dr. King's legacy and put it into practice. And on the subject of public education, I found that Dr. King wrote a piece in the Morehouse College student newspaper, The Maroon Tiger, in 1947, which included the following passages. He said, it seems to me that education is a twofold function to perform in the life of man in society. The one is utility and the other is culture. Education must enable a man to become more efficient to achieve with increasing facility the legitimate goals of life. Education must also train one for quick, resolute, and effective thinking. To think incisively and to think for oneself is very difficult. We're prone to let our mental life become invaded by legions of half-truths, prejudices, and propaganda. At this point, I often wonder whether or not education is fulfilling its purpose. A great majority of the so-called educated people do not think logically and scientifically. Even the press, the classroom, the platform, and the pulpit, in many instances, do not give us objective and unbiased truths. To save man from the morass of propaganda, in my opinion, is one of the chief aims of education. Education must enable one to sift and weigh evidence, to discern the true and from the false, and the real from the unreal, and the facts from the fiction. The function of education, therefore, is to teach one to think intensively and to think critically. But education, which stops with efficiency, may prove the greatest menace to society. The most dangerous criminal may be the man gifted with reason but with no morals. What we deal with here every other Thursday night uh, has impact for all of us. And it's in this spirit, it's this importance of Dr. King that we continue our school year and look ahead in our budget pre pre preparations and to let us not forget to think big. And I encourage all of you to join in that effort. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Public participation. I don't know if we had a yeah, sign up. Oh, we did. Before we get to public participation, I'd like to, uh, and this is a good, I think, segue into what I was just talking about. Um, on Monday evening, I had the pleasure of, and, and many of you were there as well, mm -hmm. of attending the town hall presentation, the Martin Luther King annual celebration at town hall in the evening. And one of our guests here tonight uh, was honored for her work and for her commitment to the Arlington Public Schools. And I'd like to welcome her and some of the students here at the Arlington High School tonight, uh, Ms. Carrie Dunn. I'd like to join us at the, at the table and maybe introduce those that you have with, with you. Dr. Bode? So just just a, a quick introduction. It's actually now Dr. Carrie Dunn, mm -hmm. who has <coughs> completed her doctorate at Boston College and uh, was a lot of work doing that with um, the job that she has, which is Director of Social Studies K-12. to And since Carrie has been here, um, we've had a lot of positive changes in, in, in opening up the world to our students and looking at different initiatives that um, have a global perspective and gives opportunities to students to be able to participate in, in much larger um, out, of the, out of the school opportunities. And it's, it was for her work in, in enhancing the social studies education in the Arlington Public Schools that she was awarded this year the outstanding achievement from the Martin Luther King Observance Committee. And um, she's also gone to the well a few times with them to, but to, to, and they've been very responsive and I want to give them a lot of um, kudos on that as well in being very supportive of these initiatives um, that um, Dr. Dunn has um, brought to Arlington. And one of the, one of the, you're going to hear tonight, uh, there's been a number of initiatives that, that that's sort of come collectively from the, the whole school, but, but Carrie has been um, charged with moving some of these forward, and she's going to talk about some of the other ones, but more specifically what she's here tonight to talk about and has a couple of her students is the um, academic internship program at the high school. Great. Thank you very much for the kind words, Dr. Bodie and Mr. Pierce. Um, I'll bring up three students. We, we actually had 13 students participate and complete our pilot program of the academic internship program, um, but um, we, had, you know, we couldn't have all 13 
present tonight. So I brought three. So we'll bring up Hara Blanas, Jamila Mirazadeh, and Chris Coleman. And they'll be talking to you tonight a little bit about what they experienced during their internship this past semester. So why don't the three So I'll give a little introduction and background. Our academic internship program was part of a larger initiative to really reinvent the later part of high school as a transition point to college and the workplace and life beyond college. Um, so the idea is we'd like to have different ways in which an 11th or 12th grader in Arlington High School can have one foot outside of the high school building, um, be earning some college credit maybe their senior year, be getting, getting to build a foundational resume, um, do some career exploration while they're still in high school and all the, ha have all the structures and support of high school still with them. So we have a number of pilot initiatives going on starting last year and then also this year. We have some dual enrollment. We brought in the Syracuse University dual enrollment program pilot folks last year to speak to you about our economics course that we offer on site as part of a partnership with Syracuse University. It's been very successful, it's very inexpensive. The feedback from students who've taken the course has been very positive. We had a large cohort of students graduate from Arlington High School having completed that course last year and virtually all of them were able to get the college that they matriculated to to accept the three credits from Syracuse for transfer credit, um, which is really nice in, um, in an era where AP scores are becoming less and less um, accepted for college credit. It's, it was nice to see the, uh, the success rate uh, um, for transferring that credit there. We also have some online learning initiatives. We're moving towards a blended learning model for many of our in-person classes, particularly our elective courses, where a portion of that learning will be independent online at home or collaborating with other students via an online platform at home, but there still is the face-to-face -face component on a, on a daily basis at the high school. But we're piloting also a, a true online MOOC course that's going to start up February 3rd. It's a sound engineering course offered through Coursera. We'll have John Tommaso taking the course along with 10 to 15 students. They'll take the course, it's entirely online, but they will meet once a week in person to discuss the course, hash out any problems that they experienced, um, and the final project for the course to get the completion certificate is they have to build a little sound amplifier um, themselves using soldering tools and that sort of thing so they can work with each other while they, they build their final project. So um, tonight we'll be hearing from some of our academic interns. We began this process last year searching for community partners to host some academic interns. These are students who get academic credit they get one semester's worth of one course, so 2.5 credits at the honors weight. We put it on their schedule at the end of the day so that when that period meets at the end of the day, they can leave the building at 1.30 and go to their internship site. They have to be on site five hours per week. Um, it's flex they don't have to go one hour five days a week, but they have to complete five hours per week and commit a si um, complete a signed time sheet, time log that their supervisor signs. They have a supervisor at their site who's agreed to mentor them and support them throughout this process. They need to develop or work with a team project as part of their internship experience. And at the conclusion of their internship at the end of the semester, they had to present that to our group. And we had a large group present that and it was very exciting to hear their projects. They were very impressive. We are right now in the process of starting to review this pilot program, so we've sent out feedback forms to all of our site placement um, liaisons and then also to the interns themselves to hear from them about suggestions. One piece of feedback that I'm already hearing loud and clear is the challenges of a seven-day academic schedule imposed on a five-day work week. Um, so our, our internship placement sites want students to come every Tuesday and Thursday, not every third and fifth out of seven days. Um, so, um, or every Monday and Wednesday, they want them coming on fixed days. And that's a real challenge with our current schedule. Um, so that may be something we need to dialogue more about in the future. For next year, we're looking to expand our placement sites. 
Um, I'd like to offer more in the realm of STEM, science, technology, engineering, mathematics, um, and I'm looking for other contracts in the community who'd be willing to host an intern. Um, so that's something I'll put out there. And with that, we'll hear from some of our interns. We'll start with two of our interns who are in historical site placement, and we'll conclude with Chris Coleman, who did an internship in one of the bone density labs at Mass General Hospital. So we'll start with Zaharula Hara Blanas, who's a senior at Arlington High School. Um, hi, everyone. So I was at the Old Schwab Dome. And for those of you who may not know, it's um, on 17th Mill Lane, a little tucked away behind Mass Avenue um, towards the Heights. So not very well known, but um, it's quite the interesting place if you ever wanted to visit. So um, the Old Schwab Mill is the oldest continuously operating mill site in America. Um, little known fact. However, as I was saying, it's a bit overlooked in Arlington. Um, it has great history. The Schwams came from Germany and they started the mill. It's a frame, picture frame mill. Um, and we produce circular and round lathes, um, or frames on lathes. Just kidding. <laughs> um, and so for my responsibilities, I was there every Tuesday and Saturday. The mill is open from 11 to 3. So whenever I got out early at around 1.30, I would go until 3 um, or at 2.30, it depends. Um, but I'd do around an hour every Tuesday and then four hours from 11 to 3 on Saturdays. So that's how I got my five hours, as Carrie was saying. Um, and I learned how to give tours of the mill, you know, be friendly, be nice, <laughs> give tours, um, welcome people, make them want to come back, um, and just kind of spread the word about the mill because, as I was saying, one of their major problems is with publicity. So for my outreach project, the one thing I really wanted to do for them was something that would stay with the mill and help them uh, even after I've gone off to college and I'm doing my own thing. <laughs> So I decided to compile a database for them and do a bit of an outreach program. Um, what I did is I went into Google <laughs> and I researched and tried to find people who would be interested in seeing the mill prosper for a long time after. Um, and I looked into two groups of people, specifically woodworkers and architects, simply because the mill has a large woodworking history, um, the lathes, we use the machinery as it was in the 1800s, and it takes a specific skill, a um, specific type of woodworker to appreciate that. Additionally, the mill has an interesting background story um, in its creation. It was built in three different sections, so any architects or even historic preservation people would find that pretty interesting. So I decided to send a letter of invitation for an event, which is actually this Saturday, the 25th, from 10.30 to like 1.30. And um, anyone can stop by, of course. But we sent out this letter specifically to the group of people I had researched to see if they would want to come by. And so I did the research, I wrote the letter, I sent it out to them, um, and I've been planning the event. We've kind of decided it'd be nice to have a light sort of breakfast for them, and then they would get a tour and more in-depth look at the frame making process simply because this is geared towards woodworkers and, and, and architects. And yeah, it's this Saturday. How so many people have committed to come? Um, I think so far we've had 12 people RSVP by email. Um, we're assuming more people are coming because we've heard by word of mouth, you know, people around Arlington saying, oh, we'll stop by, we'll stop by. but. Officially, we have 12. I think I sent out around 50 or so letters of invitation. Um, and, you know, a couple of them were to places farther out, like in Maine or New Hampshire. So it's understandable if they can't come. But um, it's just good for them to have us on their radar. Thank you, Hara. We'll now hear from Jamila Mirzadeh, who did her internship with the Arlington <coughs> Historical Society, the Smith Museum, and the Jason Russell House. Um, I will note before I pass the microphone to Jamila, um, she was one of our only 11th graders doing an internship this year. This is her first year at Arlington High School. She moved here over the summer from Azerbaijan, 
English is Jamila's third language after Russian and Azeri, which is the native language of Azerbaijan. And so she showed up on my doorstep on the first day of school saying she heard there was a museum internship. She wants to work at a museum. And I tried to convince her that it would be a good idea for maybe her to settle into Arlington High School first <laughs> um, before taking one foot outside of Arlington High. And she was absolutely insistent that, no, she wants to work at a museum. And um, how could she do that? And I told her to think about it, and she came back the next day and said the same thing. So we <laughs> set it up, and, uh, <laughs> um, and she had a very successful experience. So I'll let her tell us about it. Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is Jamila, and I'm new to town of Arlington. I just moved to the United States this summer with my family. So it was a huge experience for me to work in the Smith Museum, and it's also helped me a lot to gain more information about the history of town. And so I did my internship in the Smith Museum, which is an office of Arlington Historical Society, and also it is an adjoining museum to Jason Russell House, and it was built in the 1890s. Jason Russell House itself is a historic house in Arlington, and also it is a site of ferocious fight, which was the beginning of American Revolution. And it's, that was like, for me, it was really interesting working there. And so the Smith Museum itself, we have exhibits, archives, and artifacts. And so in the beginning of my internship, my duty was putting information about these collections that we have in the museum into the database. And uh, that helped me a lot because I got more familiar with the subjects that we have in the museum. And I could uh, easily choose what I'm more interested in as a topic of my research. And so the objects that I chose for my research was a woman's evening gown, which is approximately 117 years old. And so this gown was worn by Ida Robbins in, in the um, 1896 to Dresden Court. And uh, Robbins' name is well established name in the um, history of the town. And they were big benefactors of the town. And Ida Robbins herself, she was the last member of this family. And so this dress of hers, it has a bodice, which is made from white satin, and also it has a skirt, which has two layers. One of them is underskirt, and another one is tulle. And these layers of tulle, they give to the, um, to the skirt more volume, and they make it more fluffy. And my most favorite part of this dress, and also I think the most significant, is small embellishments, which are in the shape of insects. And they're made from silver beads and chenille and pearls. So in late Victorian period, it was really popular to have these embellishments in the shape of insects on the clothing, because people started moving from um, rural areas into urban and suburban areas. And so they missed nature around them. And also there was a lot of scientific discoveries and botanical discoveries. Also Darwinian theory was published. So people were just fascinated with the nature. So they started using these elements of insects and birds into their dresses. But the thing is that started in the <coughs> um, 1860s, and they started sewing alive beads and live insects on their dresses. So you kind of, y like, um, I read in really, in the articles that you could even see how that insects were moving all the dresses. <laughs> and also they were using um, stuffed birds constructions on their hats. And so mm -hmm. the more they were doing it, the more articles were published in the newspapers, how brutal it was um, killing insects and birds only because of the clothing. And even the book publi was published in 1878. And so after that, people started looking at nature more as um, inspiration, and they were doing the small embellishments in the f shape of insects in more abstract way. And they were using um, materials, just like on this dress. It was silver, pearls, and sometimes even gold. So this dress is a unique example of the fashion in the 1890s, and this decade itself, it was a very interesting doing research about the fa fashion in that decade because it was changing, a lot of changes happened, and especially the role of women in the society changed, and that reflected a lot in the clothing that they were wearing. Thank you, Jamila. So I think we all learned something new about ladies' fashion of the late 1800s and <laughs> use of live bugs and stu <laughs> stuffed birds um, for embellishment. We'll move on, and we'll hear from Chris Coleman. Chris did his internship in partnership with another Arlington High School student who actually has his college interview tonight um, with Tufts, so good luck to him. But um, we'll hear from Chris about his research at the MGH Enderkin unit. Um, so like she said, I <laughs> worked at Mass General Hospital in the Enderkin unit. What this means is that I was working to study the effects of bone density in zero gravity, so this can be anything from astronauts going to space to bed rest. So what, what this is, so bone cells generally live in humans for about 25 years before all your bones are entirely replaced. Um, the, they arise from osteoblasts, which is pretty much just a hormone that helps these grow, and they produce 
sclerostin or SOST, a protein which inhibits bone growth and rank ligand. Um, these, for all intents and purposes for <coughs> this, are just inhibitors that help the bones grow. Can you go to the next slide? Um, this is a picture of the different osteocytes that we were looking at. So our specific goal there was to study what the expression of the different cells would be at different densities. So this was helpful not only to us but to the entire research group there because it would show that let's say we found this particular density that helped this like that had the best expression this would then obviously make it easier for them to do all their experiments. So what we did was or how we what we decided was that there were really two things that could happen. The density would make no difference whatsoever or there would be a specific density that did <coughs> affect it. So what we did was we would plate a certain number of cells in each different plate and then we would over the course of a few weeks change the media so we were just keeping a constant environment for them and then we would study the results of the different expression of the three genes that I expressed earlier. Um, so this is the results. <laughs> and if you can read this, it would have helped to know what it said. <laughs> so <laughs> moving on just to try to show what this says mm -hmm. is that the different rates did in fact have or different densities did have different expression. So the, well, this slide shows how we got there. The next one's fine. Um, so this is really putting it in perspective. So the three different densities that we did were 100, 200, and 300. These mm -hmm. really aren't too useful for this, but that's <laughs> what we were doing. And we showed the RNA expression in each one. And while here they may look slightly skewed, this is taken a very, very small margin. These are, in fact, if you look at it on a bigger scale, almost entirely straight lines. So what this showed was the density of each individual expression, or so rank ligand and SOST were different, but the overall for the different densities were the same. So can you move on? So that's more or less what I just explained in the last slide here. But the different expression we showed did not make a big difference. So this helped the lab there because now they know that there is not one specific density that they need to be using for each thing to show the best expression. And this will help them in the future. And we will continue actually doing more research to try to make those bars closer and closer to show that these really are conclusive. All right, thank you. I think Karen Tassoni um, emailed you a link to the entire slideshow presentation, and it might be interesting for you to flip through and see the different internship projects and the different interns and their placements um, throughout the greater Boston area. Um, and potentially she could put that on the website too for, for folks who are interested to look at that. Mm -hmm. Terrific. Members have any questions for our students? Dr. Dunn? Dr. Allison Anthony? <laughs> I, d I appreciate hearing everyone's projects are really interesting. Um, Dr. Dunn, can you, you said that you would be interested in expanding. If any members of our audience are interested in, in things, how would they get in touch with you? Well, they should just email me for sure. Um, my email address is kdunn at arlington.k12.ma.us. The easier way to do it would just be to find the Arlington High School website, find the social studies department, and my listing right okay. there. Um, okay. And we certainly are going to need more placements. Um, we filled every potential placement we had this year with students, and um, we were deliberately keeping it small, but there was full demand, and, and we'll need to expand. I'd like to have at least 20 placements for next year. Okay, great, thank you. I went to the full show the other night, and it was just as exciting as this. Thank you all. Uh, one of the interns uh, had an internship in Cambridge, am I correct? So it, it is not a requirement to stay within the town. 
No, we had, um, well, Chris and Connor were at MGH. The connection we had there was it's actually an Arlington High School parent um, who is the principal scientist at the Bone Density Lab, um, which was great. In Cambridge, we had somebody at the Cambridge Historical Society. We also had a student who was going to uh, Dorchester, Columbia Point to intern at the Mass Archives and Commonwealth Museum. So it can be outside of Arlington. It is helpful if it's accessible by public transportation. We have a few students with cars, but most, or access to a car, but most do not. So the m most crucial piece would be access to tr public transportation. I just wanted to make that clear to our audience because we may have people, again, living in town that would be interested, but their actual workplace would be out of town. Mm -hmm. Mr. Uh, this is very exciting. Mm -hmm. One of the things we talked about a couple of years ago, I don't remember when, was the possibility of doing STEM uh, internships in greater Boston because there's so many high-tech biotech mm -hmm. companies is that when I mean, you had someone doing obviously that internship in uh, at MGH is that in is that I mean I, I realize it's not social studies well uh, I mean this internship program is not social studies specific okay. in any way okay. um, out of our 13 placements we had three that were explicitly STEM placements. Um, the two um, people at MGH, and we had a, uh, a young woman who was interning with the town engineer's office doing a really interesting satellite imagery mapping project. It was great, um, where she had to actually learn some pretty high level um, coding software, um, which was great. So um, that's the area that we need to expand the most, and we need the most additional placements in. Because um, this is town. You know, we have we have a lot of folks who work in the biotech, mm -hmm. high tech industry mm -hmm. in the town. We have about a thousand MIT alums in mm -hmm. this town, something like that. So there's a, there's a, I think there's a lot of goodwill that can make introductions. We have enough MIT mm -hmm. alum at the table, <coughs> uh, but we so uh, there's a lot of people that can make introductions in that field. So and it's something we've talked about for a while. Is this a place to grow? I mean, specifically out of the seven additional placements, I'd like to add, um, there's a demand for one or two more in a, a law office. Um, we have a lot of students. We have a really active mock trial team. They just won their first competition today. Kids who, who want to intern in a law office. So we'd like to add two or three more placements in law offices. And then I'd like to add five or six more spots that are specifically STEM placements. I run a high school with a work study program. And my experience professionally is that um, Students who work in law offices rule that out as a career after that experience. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? And That's fine. That's a cheap way for them to do that rather than spending three years in law school. I actually have data to show that. So, <clears throat> um, so that might, it's a good thing. You're right. It's a good thing to rule that out as a career. Mm -hmm. Saves you money. I'd like to recognize someone from, from the audience raising their hand. If you could stand up. I think one of the obstacles for employers would be um, investing time for mm -hmm. short periods of time. And if employers Yes, um, six of our interns are actually continuing on into the second semester. Um, so we do have the possibility for a year-long placement as well. Um, we actually had a, several students who are graduating early, so they're done at Arlington High School th on Tuesday is their last day. Um, um, and then we had students who did the internship opposite a one-semester class, so they really needed to be done at the semester. Um, but we do have students who specifically want a full year internship. So again, I think there's enough demand that if a placement said, s site said, and it was an attractive placement site, we want an intern, but we can only take somebody and invest the time if we knew we'd have them for a year, that I could find that student who we could put on their schedule for a year. So that is definitely a possibility. Well, thank you very, very much. This is incredibly interesting. I'm very happy we have this program at the high school, and uh, I hope it continues to flourish. And, and congratulations on Monday night, Dr. Dunn. Well deserved. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Moving on, uh, our agenda, we're arrived at public participation. We have four folks um, tonight who would like to speak. First, I'll do it for you if you like. Yeah, <laughs> Mike. Yes, thank you, Mike. Please. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a challenge. Rob, if you come around this side, just like, because I don't think it went through. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Mike Vadabedian. I have a daughter who is in the um, kindergarten in uh, Stratton School. 
My wife and I have written letters and have come to speak on many occasions about our concerns about the tools of the mind curriculum that was implemented in the Arlington Public Schools this year. Although we have made requests for public meetings and updating the school website to reflect what is being taught to our children, we have not seen any attempt to inform parents as to what the new curriculum is and how it works. To date, the Arlington School websites still say that they are using foundations as a kindergarten curriculum. Why do the school websites say foundations as, the, as being the curriculum instead of tools of the mind? Is there a plan to have a public meeting to allow parents to ask questions and get informed information to address their concerns? I cannot help but to think that there is a reason for the lack of information being provided. I believe that most parents are not aware of that the curriculum has changed to the tools of the mind. Most parents I, uh, I have talked to are uninformed and concerned about the new curriculum. Why, isn't, why is it that there is not more transparency about tools of the mind? I've come here tonight to once again go on record to respectfully request that a public meeting be held where parents can ask questions, make comments, and be informed about the tools of the mind curriculum. Also, to once again request that the school websites accurately reflect what is being taught to our children. I want to thank you. I want to thank the committee for affording me the time to speak here, and I look forward to your cooperation. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Um, Andrew Shea? Hi, my name is Andra Shea. Mm -hmm. I'm the person who sent each of you two Magic Treehouse books, mm -hmm. and I'd like to encourage you to read them if you haven't already. Uh, I remain opposed to the requ required use of the Magic Treehouse book series for the kindergarten curriculum, which has recently changed to Tools of the Mind district-wide. Um, I believe there are too many books of the same narrative. The scope of the books is narrow, and the themes are often too mature. Um, you've read letters from concerned parents regarding uh, some of those themes, so I won't reiterate them today, although it's always very tempting to me. Um, and Arlington has selected a play-based curriculum developed originally for preschoolers, yet the Treehouse books force themes of danger on our five and six-year-olds the minute they walk in the door of their, of their kindergarten classroom. In a district whose libraries are filled with wonderful text, it breaks my heart that these 12 books and their accompanying study guides are the only, the only required curriculum, required reading for kindergarten. I understand that teachers can supplement, but the only thing they are required to read are these books. Uh, even if the tool's curriculum is perfect, it can't be utilized without the books. Uh, additionally, and or separately, um, I have a summary from Education Week, which highlights several studies that have shown results of the tool's curriculum to be lackluster in a September 2013 study from UMass Amherst. Education researcher Patricia McKay finds a curriculum led to no improvements and some decreases in Massachusetts st students' performance on state and reading tests. Importantly, this study was published using data from kindergarteners, not preschoolers, and this is a pretty new study. Um, I'm happy to send you all a copy through the appropriate administrative channels. I think it's important to review this decision in all its parts, and I thank you very much for your time and your service to our community. Chuck Miller? Good evening, my name's Chuck Miller. I'm uh, the parent of two Thompson kids. Um, I, I, I think I'm supposed to also say my address, so I live at 9 Beacon Street, if anybody wants to come visit. Um, <laughs> I Please call first. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, so I, I just wanted to kind of, um, you know, I, I saw that this was happening. There was a lot of things flying around the Arlington parents list, and you know, there, there are folks who have had kids who were in the Tools for the Mind curriculum last year. My daughter was in uh, what was still the pilot program. Uh, my other daughter entered the same program this year now that it's incorporated across the schools. You know, all I can say is as a parent, we personally don't have any issues with the Tools for the Mind curriculum. We were pretty well informed, I would say, when we went to the Stratton, uh, when we were at Stratton last year, we went to the, um, the orientation. It was presented to us as, you know, what was being taught in the school. I, I do actually um, acknowledge a previous speaker about it not being on the website. I didn't actually know that, so I think that that, you know, probably does raise a concern for some folks. 
Um, again, when we went to Thompson for the orientation this year, um, same, same thing, we were presented the tools for the my curriculum. So I think that in general, we haven't had any issues with it. Um, a lot of the other parents who went through last year and the, you know, last year with who now have first graders, um, and then this year some of the kids in the kindergarten class as well, the parents that I've talked to have been, um, I think, fairly positive about it. I can't really say much about the Magic Treehouse books. Um, they do go through those books in you know, the, first, um, you know, the first year, but I don't think my daughter's always read any Magic Treehouse books in first grade. Um, and you know, uh, unfortunately, if, if some folks are disturbed by some of the themes in the books, uh, you know, I, I wasn't personally aware of that. My daughter seems to just sort of be more excited about learning about Egypt, learning about you know, diff different um, sort of times, but I think more so it's just kind of that ongoing theme of these two characters going from place to place. Uh, again, it's not great literature, but I don't remember great literature when I was in kindergarten. So I, I'm not trying to be glib or anything, but I, I'm not sure what my daughter would read otherwise um, that would be any better. So um, that's really all I have to say. I know a lot of times people who come to these things are, are more negative than anything, and I, I saw so many you know, comments. Most, most of the time people who have anything positive to say don't show up, so I thought I'd just come along and listen, and I'm interested in hearing what people have to say. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Chris uh, Geegan? Geyer. Geyer. Sorry. Good evening, my name is Chris Geyer. Um, I am the parent of a child in Bishop uh, kindergarten class, uh, and also of a child who uh, soon will be going to kindergarten in about two years. Um, actually, tonight is my, my date night, and I would otherwise be enjoying a concert with my wife, but uh, I thought this was a very important issue. I wanted to uh, raise some concerns that I had. Um, I became interested in this issue because I, one night, I love to read stories to my kids, and uh, my wife had purchased some of the Magic Treehouse books. And I was reading the, I think, the Pirates. I don't remember the name of the title. Um, and started reading one of, the, I think, the second chapter at a point where the pirates were grabbing the kids, where one of the pirates points a pistol at the kids. And I did not feel comfortable reading that material. Of course, I could have diverted and surely you know, read around that passage, and I think I don't, I think I ended up doing so. Um, but then I realized, and I looked at some of the other books that were in the series, the fact the ninjas, the saber-toothed tigers, the flesh-eating piranhas, the jaguars, the mummies, the medieval knights, it seemed to be a consistent theme of storylines centered around violence and chases, and, and just not, as a series, something that seemed appropriate for kindergartners. Maybe one or two books, would be great. It just didn't seem to me like something that is a series that I would choose for my, my kids in kindergarten. Um, exciting, definitely. Uh, definitely gripping and exciting, just not something as a series, again, as a whole series, taking the whole series, something that was appropriate for that age. Um, I attended a meeting earlier this month, one of the subcommittee meetings, curriculum subcommittee sub meetings, and found out other per parents were concerned, like I was. Um, and um, I learned from some of the teachers that, um, that the curriculum sort of, in my mind, what it sounded to me, sounded like they were sort of put into a straitjacket in terms of what they could teach, um, what books they could use, what posters could be on their walls, and tr methods that they had experience in or material that they had a lot of experience in. Uh, they were told to buy coaches from the tools of the mind not to use. And that was, I, I really came, in part I came to Arlington, I think it was uh, four years ago, because we liked the education system here. We, um, you know, and I trust the teachers. I trust their experience. Um, that, uh, that they don't, I, I'm not going to say that they told me they felt uncomfortable, but they just, it did not seem, it seemed like something was missing. Um, I also heard from other parents who said that they thought there was a lack of diversity in some of the things, uh, I think the ninjas, that there was cultural stereotypes that were not appropriate. Um, so those are, those are some of my concerns. You know, I think um, I, I'd like to hear, I, like the other gentlemen, I'd like to hear more about the curriculum and why we're using it. I'd like the teachers to have more autonomy and what, what other reading material they can supplement the curriculum with. So thank you for your time. Appreciate your service. Okay, that concludes our public participation mm -hmm. portion of the evening. Um, moving on to
our superintendent. Uh, we have a report which includes an update on this particular current bill. Um, I'm going to um, ask uh, Dr. Chesson to talk to um, the process that we're going through. We did meet with parents who expressed concern around the, uh, the content of the Magic Treehouse series. We have, um, at, at this juncture, we have the person who has been the, probably one of the lead um, uh, people in the Tools of the Mind program. In fact, she was the lead investigator through NYU who has agreed this, to come to Winchester for an evening presentation. Um, I don't have the date yet. I don't know if that has been set. No, it hasn't been yet. But it will be coming probably very in, in the Winchester next. Or Arlington? Arlington. Arlington. Oh, okay. You said Winchester. You said Did Winchester. I say Winchester? It's okay. <laughs> She's giving her straight advice. This has been a long day. <laughs> <laughs> but, but. Uh, we're annexing Winchester now. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, well, they're interested, so <laughs> maybe I'll invite them too. Let's do it. Um, uh, so, it, in fact, there's probably some other districts that I think are very interested in this as well. Um, in fact, Lexington has this in its preschool and is very interested actually in um, um, putting it into it, its kindergarten. The program that we have, by the way, is a kindergarten program, it is not a preschool program. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, it's something that we are considering. Um, moving into our preschool program in the next few years. But there has been some concern expressed around the, uh, the content of the books, um, concern that some of, the, some of the themes may be too, um, too, too scary for students listening to this. Um, I can tell you that I have talked with, at this point, I think maybe two-thirds of the kindergarten teachers in this district, and um, ask them explicitly whether they're reading the uh, alleged passages and they are not. As, as when we had that meeting with um, uh, Sherry Donovan, who is our, our curriculum coordinator for Tools of the Mind, I should say she's curriculum coordinator, she is the kindergarten, pr um, the elementary principal who is um, in charge of the Tools of the Mind program. She organizes um, the professional development, for that program as well as uh, works with the, the mentor. She is the liaison to the Tools of the Mind program in the Arlington Public Schools. Um, but at any rate, we have, we have uh, talked with her and part of the process at that meeting that Mr. Thielman mentioned to the parents was that there was a policy of the, Ar of the um, Arlington Public Schools that had a process when they had an issue around a particular curriculum or parts of a curriculum that would be initiated and I think that one of the parents, uh, maybe two of the parents, contacted uh, Stacy Kitsis who is our uh, librarian for the high school asking for that form which was then sent and then submitted and the process uh, which I will let um, Laura Chesson talk about is uh, already in motion and um, I'll, as I said I will let her speak to where we are with that. Uh, we are very, we're, we're taking very seriously the concerns um, and there'll be a process that we look at this. But the thing that I want to say about the Magic Treehouse, just in terms of a global look at this, is that it is, no, as somebody's mentioned, it's not great literature. It's, it's not great, necessarily great literature. What it does is become sort of a, a thread that is an activator for the different themes that the kindergarten, um, teachers and students engage in for a three-week period. And essentially, we, do, we look at the first eight books of the series. I think the series actually goes up to something like 38 books. And in fact, I've actually had a slew of emails recently from parents, which I will get to you, very much in support of this, and in fact, talking about how, uh, how some of the, their children have continued in reading these books. It is an activator. It is not the only literature that's being read in our kindergartens, and that is really important to understand. Uh, and it's not even literature that's particular to the theme, though kindergarten teachers do try very much if they're looking at um, Japan or Egypt or other areas of the world, they try to have um, literature that would be um, particular to that 
uh, that area. They, they bring in um, outside outside people to help students learn a little bit more about Japan. I was in uh, classrooms just recently where the, ch the children were learning how to write letters in, in Japanese. And they had someone coming in to teach origami. So it's, a, it's an activator. It is a very small part of it. It's, it keeps the thread of um, it, it going, of the curriculum going. So most of the teachers are using it in, in that way. Um, they are using a lot of discretion with respect to if there's some passages that they don't they don't think is appropriate or they think might be too scary. They are not reading them, and that has to every person I have talked with has said that exactly exactly that. And uh, Sherry Dunn had talked about that in the subcommittee meeting that that was um, her experience, uh, her her sort of mandate, and I don't even say mandate, but. Um, uh, her belief that teachers would exercise a lot of professional judgment, and in fact, they are. So let me just turn this over to Laura, who is going to be chairing this committee and talk and talk about what the process will be and what the plans are going forward. Um, before I do that, I just want to um, bring forward a point that we have four teachers who are currently working on the documentation that's to be put up on the website. We felt that it was really important for that documentation to come specifically from teachers as they're the closest to the curriculum um, and also to make sure that they do a quality job. And they're doing this on top of teaching their classes and doing their um, new teacher evaluation system, taking their retail courses and several other initiatives in the district. So that's why it's taking them a little bit of time to get it up there. But I want to assure everyone that we have four teachers, two from Thompson and two from Hardy, who are currently working on um, the documentation that will be coming up on the website very uh, shortly. I've already spoken to Claudia Bartoli, who is the um, person who does our website. She's ready and waiting. As soon as they have the documentation available for her, she will be putting it up on the website. Um, so about the request for reconsideration of material, um, we did have that uh, filed by two parents of a student enrolled at the Stratton School in accordance with the school committee policy KEC and KEC-R. Um, as called for by the policy, I've, I've organized a review committee with the makeup that's called for in the policy. Um, the first is a principal representative, and that will be Sherry Dunn of the, Donovan of the Thompson School. Um, the director of media services, which is Stacy Kitsis. Uh, we will have a kindergarten teacher from the Brackett School. And uh, the citizen representative will be uh, Becca Steins. Uh, Becca Steins is a science is works as a literacy consultant in um, many many schools she has a PhD in English and has previously taught at Ohio Wesleyan University and created one of the teacher education programs at Leslie University School of Education she's the president of the Arlington Educational Foundation and has two children in the Arlington Public School District one at Audison and one at the high school did you want to add okay um, uh, I will be chairing the committee um, uh, I am also currently chairing the, the search committee for the Dallin principalship search. And upon conclusion of that work, um, which would be around the February time frame, we have interviews three nights next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and when then we'll have visitations of finalists the week after that. Um, at the conclusion of that work, um, I will meet with the con committee uh, to discuss the protocol that we'll be using that's also talked to in the policy to review the curriculum materials as guided by that policy. Also, the initial meeting will determine the schedule for the review of the materials. Um, we will, following the policy, invite the parents that filed the reconsideration request uh, to come forward to uh, express their concerns. And we will also, as called for by the policy, invite the teachers and administration that uh, participate in the selection of the materials will be invited to present um, regarding their selection. At the completion of uh, listening to that and also personally reviewing each and every piece of material by the committee, uh, the committee will make a report to Dr. Bodie. Um, it's expected that the committee will complete its work um, sometime in the mid to late March. Okay. Questions? Questions? Questions from the members? Um, I did want to ask, and mm -hmm. I'm not sure who's in the best position to answer this, but in the interim, things will be status quo. That's what the policy calls for, actually. That said, um, it's my understanding there are approved reading lists for each grade level, including kindergarten, from which teachers can select 
books to read. There are many, many other uh, materials that are supplemented. And a actually, I'll, I've visited many, as Dr. Bodhi has, many of the classrooms already. But I will be going around to each classroom and documenting the variety of materials that they include. So as long as they're on that approved district list, they're welcome to be used, not just if they're Magic Treehouse books. Just clarifying. Yes. Restating mm -hmm. it a different way. Yes, thing. yes. Perfect. Um, and then um, at the beginning of the year, despite the fact that our website has been slow to catch up with this, at the beginning of the year, um, every elementary school mm -hmm. does have curriculum informational event mm -hmm. for the mm -hmm. parents. Um, was this presented? Mm -hmm. at all the, in all the schools? Yes. Yes. And one last. I, I did not attend every teacher's I, presentation, no. so I can't. I'm, I'm trusting you to have had the conversation this was, with your was principals. When we have curriculum nights, the intent is that we, uh, um, that they, the teachers talk about what is the curriculum in their, in their classroom. And, um, I, I can't attest to everything that was said in the classroom, but this is what they're be talking about. That's what we, the purpose of having a curriculum night. And my one last point is um, from somebody that came on this committee when we had elementary schools er each doing their own thing with curriculum, and mm -hmm. we worked very hard to get everybody to a place so that we could guarantee a baseline of good education for all our students. And my understanding is the last place we had teachers doing an alternative curriculum was the bishop under their previous principal. And that actually mm -hmm. did not yield as good results as the district approved curriculum. I just do not want to see people deviating from what is good for students in learning and being back to a position where we don't have all our elementary students equally prepared. Mm -hmm. so yeah, we work very, very hard to make sure that we have an equitable education so that when every student comes to sixth grade, they've had this, uh, a very similar, if not exactly the same, educational experience K through five. Thank you. Mr. Thelma. I have just a couple of questions. The policy allows the complainant to make a presentation. That's correct. And I've said that we're going we're gonna to invite them to do so. Yes. so are you going to invite, you, is this a public meeting, you know, about other people to come in? It, your, it doesn't, I, Dr. Bordy and I will have to discuss that. It does not specifically state in the policy that the meeting will be a, pu a public meeting. So we'll have to discuss that and certainly we'll discuss that with the chair of the school committee as well. Okay. I it do, it's, it's silent on that. It is silent on that. Um, Wait, is, may I interrupt and answer a little bit more on that? Uh, even though it's not a public posted meeting, we will certainly let kindergarten parents know that that they can um, speak at this. In oh, fact, good, one of the one of the early issues is what's the protocol. So, uh, like the school committee has, there's a there has to be some kind of a protocol in terms of time and. Yeah. Okay. okay. Right. So we, we haven't established that you protocol yet. Protocol, but you're, you're, you're okay. The mm -hmm. next question. Um, <clears throat> you know, the policy says the status quo remains. Is this assumption correct? Is the curriculum? And this is a follow up on Reba's question. Is, is the Tools of the Mind curriculum being delivered in all 22 kindergarten classrooms in all seven schools in Arlington right now? This is a discussion I've had with the principals. I'm not sure there's entire fidelity. Okay. Um, this is a discussion that this had with the elementary principals, and we're going to have more discussion. We have a meeting the first, uh, the first of February, uh, well, the first Monday in February, and we're going to be talking about that. Um, we have, as part of this program, we have a mentor, and we have changed mentors in the last, um, s since um, December. And the mentor goes to every classroom in the district. So to that, to the extent that the mentor, um, observes what's going on in the classroom, um, we, they're, they're not there every day, and they're only there maybe once a month or twice a month. In addition to that, we have, um, we have two teachers that who were in the original pilot. In fact, there were three schools in the original pilot. And two of those teachers um, are mentors in the program this year as well. On the other hand, they don't go out to other classrooms Teacher, all the other teachers who were not in the pilot 
go to their classroom on a regular basis as well. They have a schedule for that. So there is um, both the, the principals who are looking for things to, to honestly looking for things that they should be looking at in the classroom and that, that is something that we are working on. But we also have the mentor who comes from the Tools of Mind program and goes into all of the classrooms and we have the, we have the non-pilot um, schools and the teachers from those schools attending a regular in-class visit with the mentors. And in fact, this is not any different than we do with our reading or math program. When we have new teachers in the elementary coming into the district or teaching a grade for the first time, we have a math and a reading mentoring program where we have a math mentor for each grade and a, and a reading mentor for each day grade and they go five times a year to that classroom and observe for the morning or the afternoon depending on which program it is. So, so we're doing exactly the same thing with the tools program but we actually they have more opportunity than five times to go to uh, the mentor's classroom and watch the class and have discussions after that and debrief about the lessons. Mr. Hainer? Um, I've got several questions. First off, prior to this program, we had a program called Foundations, am I correct? In the kindergarten? Well, that's one of the many programs that we had. We also had uh, the AMC program for okay. math. And Thank you. <coughs> can, fund, can I interrupt in a second? Sure. Foundations is a phonics program, and we put a phonics program in quite a few years ago. Um, uh, Tools of the Mind has its own phonics program and there is a l tremendous amount of overlap between the two. There's some differences and these are more technical things in terms of cards that are used but we, we do start, um, um, move, the intention is and the practice is to start moving more toward the foundation so that there's a transition to first grade. How many years in the, are in the contract that we have with Tools of the Mind? Two years. This is the first well, we had, we had the pilot in which all of our mar mar materials for that pilot were paid through the, the study that was being done by NYU. Um, so we have two years on this, pro on this um, contract. And we, we're in the first year of that? We contract? are in the first year of that, yes. So, okay. Um, and I heard you use the word mentor two different ways. One comes from the program. Yes. They, my understanding, they call coaches to make differentiation okay. between the two. Okay, they call them mentors, but it is okay. a coach. It is uh, a coach that comes in. Are yes. they an element of the program? In other words, could we have this program without the coaches? If once we have, we have teachers trained right now. You said so. Not the way it's set up with Tools of the Mind. No, the, um, part of the contract is having a coach because, as, as any new program, you need some level of coaching to help. But you indicated that the teachers do go out to, and we have mentors because they they had already done the program for two years, and and so in order to actually see someone who's experienced teaching it, it's one thing for somebody to come in and coach. So we're doing it from two different perspectives: one coaching, watching the the teacher teach in their classroom to see what they would make as su suggestions. And then we also have teachers going out to our own teachers to observe a full lesson in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Is this program, and this may be something you need to check on, compatible with all the IEPs that are in existence in the kindergarten? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And eventually, at the end of the two years, will the program be self-sustaining? That's the intention, yes. So and that we have a consistent program through all of our elementary. All things aside, I'm not suggesting that it's definite, but a year from next, in fiscal 16, we will we not be budgeting for anything except uh, expendable materials for this program, am I correct? Um, sort of, mostly yes, but there's a little no to that too. Um, when, if, let's say we were to have a new teacher um, come in. Let's say we had next year we had to open a kindergarten classroom. Mm -hmm. We would be sending that teacher to, I believe, is it a week or two weeks? One week. It's one week um, intensive. But our, training. our own staff could not bring that person up to speed. That might be something that we could mm -hmm. do down down the way, but I'm not sure that we would do that. I, I can't answer that right now. 
uh, but our what we have done is when we've had new teachers we have provided them with that training I've got to say mm -hmm. that at the curriculum committee meetings that I I sit on mm -hmm. the concern that I have heard is that some of the materials not the program were questioned and what I'm hearing is that from one of my our members here, we're looking for consistency in a program and not deviation. But I'm hearing that the teachers have the option to pick and choose what they're reading in the program. I'm confused. Well, it would be, for example, when they would be covering something that had to do with Egypt, both of us would supplement with other books in our different stations that would have to do with Egypt. But we'd both still read that particular book? That We still read that particular book, but I would have stations within my classroom that might have a video that a child could watch that was about Egypt or a, a piece of music that might have something to do but, with that. But what I thought I heard from uh, Ms. Donovan is that teachers would have the right to exclude, depending on their audience, to exclude excerpts from those books. That's correct. The Magic Treehouse books, the teachers are, are encouraged to use their professional judgment that if they have a passage then, that they think is okay, too. The question I'm asking is if I can chop up a book mm -hmm. that so, several of us have said that is not great literature, we're just going to, why not just get a separate book, that supplemental material that you talked about? I think it's important for us to follow the policy and have the commit and call the committee to I, order and have and hear not, all the information. I was not trying to make a decision or get us to make a decision. I'm just trying to understand where the things are. And I hope I can bring an answer to Thank that you. for you. Yeah, uh, with respect to, to literature, we, a lot of the kindergartens, and I don't, I don't know if this is universal, um, have people come in and do reading, read, read um, stories. And in fact, I've even met a, someone who introduced herself to me the other night who had come in and into um, one of the classrooms to read. And I asked, are they required to read a book about that theme? And the answer is no. So there's a lot of other literature. In fact, most, a lot of the supplemental materials um, aren't necessarily uh, from that theme, but they try to bring in some, some of that because the intent is that through this process, and there's a lot of goals um, around the program, of which you've heard a lot about in the last two years as we've made this, tried to make this decision. Um, th there, we, we certainly want them to, to have the geographic perspective and the, the cultural perspective as well, but there are other wonderful books, and I know that teachers are reading them to their, their students. And some students reading on their own, and there are, books in the classroom that they can read. Mm -hmm. Any other questions from the members? Yeah. Dr. Allison Anthony. Yeah. Um, I'm just mm -hmm. trying to reiterate. So I've heard about two different meetings coming up. One is the tools leader who will be coming, mm -hmm. and the other is um, it sounds like the review committee will have some sort of public. An organize, we'll have an organizing meeting an or first. Yeah. Right, but I mean later there will yes. be something. Okay. Yes. How can parents make sure that they're informed of when those meetings are? Mm -hmm. I will be uh, sending notices out through um, the el the elementary principals, or I will send it out through the my mechanism of everyone. But I can't differentiate by grade, so they will be notified. Right. I was. I'm just so as long as they're on the elementary their elementary school's news email list, they should get That's it, correct. and it'll also show up on the website. Yes, um, okay. it'll be on. It'll so be in both. So that's what they can watch yes. for. Is it'll mm -hmm. come through? Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, I see. I see some folks who, who may still want to speak mm -hmm. in the audience. I invite you to email all of us, as many of you already have. I thank Miss Shea for sending us the actual <laughs> books. That was very kind of you to do, and very thoughtful and considerate. Thank you. I did not have those at home. Mm -hmm. um, we have public participation at every one of our school committee meetings, and we, we open it up to folks. If you don't get here right at 7 to sign up, please come again on February 13th, possibly February 6th, um, to speak to us. If you don't get your stuff in writing to us, we want to hear from you. We want phone calls and emails. At least I do. I'm speaking for all the members. I'm sorry. I do. Um, we have 
we have a policy, as, as, as Dr. Bodie and others have said, it's filed KEC. You can find it on the Arlington Public Schools website. It talks about when there is a complaint about a particular piece of literature or book. Read the policy. It's just one page. It's very informative. I'd like to see the process followed, as Dr. Chesson has indicated, it's going to start in February mm -hmm. um, after some of the Dallin work is done. And then th there'll be some presentation to the superintendent who will mm -hmm. then present it to the school committee. Mm -hmm. And then I think at that point, if there's still uh, some um, dispute or some discussion about the, the evidence, um, <laughs> then I think the public hearing would be uh, much warranted. So in other words, I'd like to see one process start continue and finish, and then establish a public hearing for everyone else who would like to speak who hadn't spoken mm -hmm. after that's conducted. That would, that, ideally, that's what I'd like to see, that, that through line. Um, so we, we don't allow for questions and answers. This is, a, this is a working meeting of the school committee. Again, I invite mm -hmm. all folks who want to continue to speak to us to continue to speak to us through email or phone call or to come to another mm -hmm. meeting or to come to a subcommittee meeting. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of avenues to talk to us about this. Um, and I look forward to that conversation. Um, anything else on tools of the mind tonight, Mr. Schlicken? I, I'm just very interested to see the uh, result of the committee. I think that's a great process. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> Ninja book is at a late first grade reading level. So um, I'm conceptually having a little trouble of thinking of something that's written at a first grade level being troublesome in a kindergarten. Uh, can but, I can I just introduce yeah. for that? One of the things I think that is very difficult to sort of picture how it's going to be, and I would also mm -hmm. say that um, Sherry Donovan, who's the principal of the Thompson School, and I'm sure the other principals would say the same thing, but Sherry said it at the subcommittee meeting, would welcome anybody to contact her and come to visit her school. I think you'd have a better idea of what the classroom looks like if you came to visit. Yeah, I, I'm just saying that, you know, I, I'd like to see the, the process play out and people who have opinions on both sides mm -hmm. be able to participate because um, I'm not quite seeing the controversy. And I, I'm, I'm trying to and I would like to so that if it comes back for us, we make a, an informed decision, which is why I'm very appreciative of having the, the committee set up and the participation of anyone who wants to come and talk and make a point. And if there is uh, a way to strengthen the program, I think this will, will, will bring about that result. And I just want to mm -hmm. emphasize that, that we try to tie our agenda items mm -hmm. um, to our meetings, to, to our mm -hmm. district goals, and that's also on our website. Our 2013-2014 mm -hmm. district goals says under goal two, staff excellence and professional development, that goal two, mm -hmm. subset three, kindergarten teachers will be supported with mm -hmm. professional development to implement the Tools of the Mind program mm -hmm. in all APS kindergartens in September 2013. And can you tell us definitively that that has been, has been done? I would say that the professional development is in place, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. um, I would also say that professional development around mm -hmm. this program has been mm -hmm. very thoughtfully done and is mm -hmm. fairly substantial. Well, I look forward to more conversations on this. I'd like to invite the superintendent to con continue your report if you'd like to. I think, is, is it the next item that you'd like to speak to, or are you going to skip this? Uh, we could. I might let, <laughs> let you have a break. <laughs> it's okay, whatever you'd like to do. Yeah. I, I actually have a number of things to talk about. All right. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah, let's okay. go. Okay, let's go. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, um, this today we had mm -hmm. a wonderful assembly at Odison Middle School. And uh, our district attorney, Marion Ryan, came and spoke mm -hmm. around about cyberbullying. Mm -hmm. I have to compliment both um, district attorney Ryan and the Addison Middle School for really uh, an exceptional experience. She was, as I said to her later, she is a born teacher and storyteller, and she had those, those students. We had 1,100 students in the gymnasium, sitting on the floor in the bleachers, and Mr. Hainer was there with me, they were wonderful. They were very polite, very cooperative, collaborative to questions she asked. And, but, but she did a fabulous job of bringing home how important it is for them to be careful about what they do on their handheld devices. In fact, she was very interactive with the students and asking them how many, how many of them had a smartphone or a phone or an iPad and 
a sea of hands. I don't know if there was anybody who didn't raise their hand. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty amazing. But she talked about the, the trouble that students can get in. And one of, the, one of the important cautions is that often students believe that when they meet somebody in a chat room that they really are who they are. They really are the age or even the sex that they are. And she gave some very, um, very good examples. Um, and actually, her team was there as well in, in, in the second part of the presentation. Um, they also reiterated that. But ju judging from the students, they were listening. And hopefully, they take this to heart because um, certainly what is really rising in this, um, this age group and, and, and older and younger, for that matter, while a lot of other risky behaviors are going down, such as smoking and um, um, drinking alcohol, for example, this is rising a lot. And it's actually very dangerous. What she did is says, you know, your, your parents have all told you and your little children to be, don't talk to strangers. And yet, through this medium now, that is happening. And you just have to be very careful that you are not trusting that. Um, so she was very effective. Um, and her team was as well. And, and these students sat for an hour and a half through a very long presentation, and they were terrific. That's great. Yeah. I'd just like to add, uh, I, as Dr. Cody said, I would like to commend uh, the students, the staff. Uh, I know what it's like to have uh, an assembly of that many students, and uh, they were they were enthralled. And good speakers, you don't feel like an hour and a half has gone by until it's gone. And <laughs> I learned a lot of things today. I also, once again, learned how old I am when they were asked how many had phones. <laughs> And I don't think there were three people in that whole room that didn't say they had phones. Yeah. Which she, she really touched on the bullying part of it, too, and how students can go, you know, you get mean, people can say mean things to you, but when we were growing up, you could go home and you were in your haven. But today, it travels with you, and they can see in writing mean things. Honestly, this is, I was, one of my strongest suggestions to parents of children this age, in fact, mm -hmm. even high school, is take away the cell phone at night. I mean, you know, take it away. It shouldn't be there in their bedrooms. It shouldn't be there when they're doing homework. Don't let them have it. Mm -hmm. um, you, and I think that that would be one way to really monitor what's going on and to take a look periodically at what they're accessing. Mm -hmm. The other important message, and I, and I we really stress this with high school students, she gave a story of a high school student who was a great football player, had really done a lot of work in high school to get himself to the point where he, would, he was really a strong candidate for a very good school that, and, and, and went there on a football scholarship. And during his first year there, he went to a party. Mm -hmm. And th this school has very definitive rules about what behavior they will um, tolerate from their uh, athletes. And he went to the party. Pictures were taken, mm -hmm. some of them inappropriate, that showed that he was really breaking the rules. And they took his scholarship away. The, the, the thing that, that um, and she also said there's a, an app now that people think that you can send out a picture and it's deleted as soon as the person opens it. I think it's called um, Snapchat. Snap, right, <laughs> Snapchat. But the, but the truth of the matter is it never is gone. It is there. And anybody who has any skills with technology can, in fact, um, find those pictures. And so in our high school students, we emphasize, and in fact, in our digital citizenship classes, at, uh, in technology classes at the middle school, we emphasize, remember that anything that you put out there digitally is there. And mm -hmm. this can really affect um, so many things in your life, mm -hmm. and you need to be very careful about that. And they also talked about, um, for example, they think, well, I put something up on Facebook, and two minutes later, I'll take it down. He says, you don't understand that out there, there are robots grabbers that mm -hmm. go through the whole internet on a regular basis grabbing material. You have no guarantee that with even two seconds after you put it up that it's not going to be grabbed and it's just there. So 
it was very effective, strong messages, and I thought it was important to sort of pass these on because uh, we need parent support in this because it, it's just it's such a rising risky behavior. And she had a lot of examples. Uh, she had several examples that were um, quite, um, I think, wake up calls that she gave. So, uh, yeah. sorry. Mm -hmm. my student was sick today. <laughs> I'm wondering, is there any place that people can reference the material outside of having gone to the presentation? I actually have an answer to that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> One of the English teachers mm -hmm. um, for eighth grade was absent today, mm -hmm. and so to help her students um, mm -hmm. pay attention to the presentation, she asked them to write her a letter about the presentation with pertinent information mm -hmm. that she may have missed. So I mm. actually got to read um, a, th a nice little three-paragraph essay about this presentation mm. before coming here tonight. But that's a great assignment because it makes them yeah. think about all these messages that were there. So what, mm. what did uh, what was mm. your daughter's takeaway? Um, I, um, I think this listening to her perspective on it really pointed out the difference between my generation and mm. our children's because. Um, her assumption is there is no such thing as privacy. So, mm -hmm. so even the putting the pictures up, she said, you know, the, the big message really should be don't do anything mm -hmm. that you don't want to have captured mm -hmm. to begin with. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not just don't take a picture of it, it's don't do it. And so that was, you know, she, she pretty much, um, mm -hmm. you know, but unfortunately, mm -hmm. based on, the nature of my employment mm -hmm. and the nature mm -hmm. of working on this committee, mm -hmm. she's she's been much mm -hmm. more knowledgeable about this than mm -hmm. perhaps some other children of the middle school. But mm -hmm. um, but they, you know, they um, they definitely got the main messages. That's great. That's great. Do you she was very effective. Something on the internet, post a picture of your cat. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he's talking about. <laughs> One of the things that the the presented the, the assistant district attorney said whenever you get an app or you join some group is that little accept and very few people ever read uh, oh. the full the whole thing and th if you look in detail the one on Facebook it basically says all pictures all statements are the property of them not you forever so whatever they can do whatever they want with that stuff and th th they're supposedly one of the reputable groups mm -hmm. It's, uh, I, I know for, for parents um, with children this age, it's, it's, I'm sure it's a huge concern as to how you monitor all of the different places they could be going. And of course, one of the biggest issues is what they're seeing from, uh, from students that may be um, saying mean things because it's, you just, you want to get away from that. And as she said, in those days, in our days when we were growing up, you had to actually, if you wanted to make a phone call to your, to your friend, you had to call the landline in the house and have mom and dad answer the phone and say, hello, uh, this is. And so you, you were very reluctant to, uh, to do what we're, what we're seeing students do today. So I thought it was a very effective, and I really want to um, thank um, District Attorney Ryan for coming personally. Um, she doesn't always go to all of these mm -hmm. programs because it's part of our membership of Middlesex, Middlesex Youth uh, Partnership and um, to get a number of assemblies a year. So we were felt very fortunate that she came. Um, I also want, and um, our school resource officer, um, Detective Steve Porcello was there and I want to, this sort of segues into the next, uh, the next topic. And that is, um, as you are aware, we had um, a shelter in place at Hardy quite recently due to the bank robbery. But the reason for bringing this up is that uh, I want to compliment the police for how well they communicated with the school uh, during that incident, and they were uh, they, they were terrific, um, as they off as they are all the time. But I think it's important that they sometimes have a job where they don't get the compliments that they should. 
And speaking of compliments, uh, another one I want to give is to our de Department of Public Works. They did an absolutely terrific job this week in working all night to make sure the roads were in good shape, the school parking lots were in good shape, and s that we could open um, after the storm, which it wasn't a lot of snow, but it was snow that made the roads very slippery unless you had had the treatment. And I know they were up we hours when I was up because I was talking <laughs> and they were up <laughs> early in the morning too so uh, they, they was they were terrific good call mm -hmm. oh thank you it was mm -hmm. Can I, I heard a lot of compliments on the call there's a lot of very happy parents um, the two things that I also heard calling it a two-hour delay but having Audison start at 10 and the high school start at 10 confuses people or yes. the exact starting time so I'm suggesting next time in the email can we say when this you know, don't say two-hour delay say there's a delay or a delayed opening school you know Audison will start at 10 elementary school start at 10 15 or whatever it is um, and then the second thing is the phone call in the morning was not met with um, a lot of happiness because it came very early and it didn't actually provide additional different information and so I'm just if you know if we're gonna do that could have gone through an email people could if they need to know they can look for it um, the phone call could come later if you feel like you really want a redundant phone call I mean to, to help people but yeah no that, that, that was good feedback I have heard the one about the 10 o'clock that that was an, an issue um, so I've told the elementary principals I will not say 10 o'clock again it's just, but I but your point is well taken is to say exactly what the time would be um, I actually gave a lot of thought as to when to send it out S see on our email system on our news not everybody um, in fact just take for Audison there are 40 families that do not have um, internet and we send everything out by hard copy so um, I thought about the redundancy for most people but I wanted to reach them because those families at least have um, a telephone but it wasn't providing any new or different information but they may not have had the internet information the first oh, they didn't, they get, didn't the get the first message. message okay so maybe we want to do the phone call at yeah. night mm -hmm. well no, I, mean I hadn't decided at night whether we were going to have no school or early uh, delayed opening. Well, I th if I may, I, I thought that the message that you sent out saying that as of now we have a two-hour delayed opening and we'll reconsider that. I if the phone call automated message goes out and says we're now scheduling a two-hour delayed opening, we will contact you further if we are closing school. Expect to start two hours uh, late. Would, would be the way to go. Um, yeah, I, I don't. Have, what Hopefully, there's time? not next time, but there probably will be. <laughs> but when was the last time we did a delayed opening? Uh, maybe two years ago. Yeah, it seemed to work extraordinarily well, and I think that everybody that I talked to thought it was an excellent decision the way it was w was done. To first of all, not to jump the gun and go for the delayed opening, and inform folks on the previous night that if circumstances change we might consider closing school that was that was an excellent strategy I really thought that was very well done thank you but it's good to get the feedback um, I, I mm -hmm. again I thought should I do this at 630 should I do this at 7 some people are gonna sleep in I it's just, like, been miffed at I just want you, know. you to know that as a working parent mm -hmm. I need it early I leave mm -hmm. and I need yeah. to know what is happening mm -hmm. so yeah. I thought the email was perfectly clear you know, right now it's delayed opening. I'm going to let you mm. know in the morning what it is. Yeah. And in the morning, mm. I got the call. I need it early. I'm mm. getting ready for work. I need to know who to get up, who not to get mm. up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it can't come Thank much you. later than that. So, yeah. six okay. is, you know, mm. well, I think that it was so yeah. great. <laughs> Live and learn with these. But anyway, thank you for the feedback. I appreciate it. Um, the other thing, at, uh, well, then we'll get to technology. Is that we are very talking about kindergarten. We are very close to beginning the kindergarten registration, and that all will be available online as we did last year. Since last year, we learned a lot through the central registration process, and we have um, somewhat fine-tuned. Excuse me, one second. Here's the key to go. You're going to lock it. That's right. 
or if we can close it. Uh, oh, I have it. Mm -hmm. We've had, we've, we've looked at a number of things, and I, I don't necessarily need to go through all of the, the changes. Some of them are quite small. But we, but one thing I did want to mention is that we had our attorney take a look at our forms and just to see if there's anything that we needed to update to change the wording of it. And, and we did change some things. The other thing that is different this year is that we are also going to, for the high school and the middle school, while the process will not be central, it will be still locational, um, we are going to also auto, um, digitalize it as well so that they can do all of the forms um, online before they actually come in. So um, what we, we will be having is announcements very soon as to what days they actually can come in. They're all going to be in March as they did last year. So that's happening. So now I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Chesson to talk about technology. Um, as you're probably well aware, um, this has been a very busy year in technology. Um, thus far this year, we have uh, instituted a one-to-one -one, um, situation in Thompson with iPads K through 5. Uh, we've also deployed 17 new carts spread across six elementary schools. We've given iPads to teaching staff at Pierce, Dallin, and Audison, and all the other elementary schools actually had them up to this point. We put in a mobile language lab of um, 30 iPad minis for Audison. We have a one-to-one -one pilot for the 610 cluster at Audison. We also have an iPad cl uh, cart that's being shared by the 630 cluster at Audison. Mm -hmm. um, the 610 cluster held an open house for parents uh, of their students um, involved in the pilot before Christmas break. Those students presented uh, cluster procedures and they were quite eloquent about the cluster procedures regarding the proper use of iPads. And I thank our elementary uh, people who have uh, sort of piloted this at their schools that um, provided some really great input to the uh, 610 uh, group. Um, these students also demonstrated several applications that they're using in science, math, and ELA and social studies. Um, through the generosity of the AEF, we've uh, expanded our STEM lab at the high school, which um, will currently this week receive an, uh, an additional iPad cart to be used to conduct simulations in math and science. Um, this cart is in addition to the laptops that were purchased this year through the AEF grant um, that were used for our new two um, computer science classes being offered at the high school. Um, all this, these devices wouldn't work well if we didn't have the proper network structure. Um, there have been significant network up upgrades. Um, we started the year with two 50 meg pipes, um, talking about the amount of bandwidth that's coming into the school district for instructional use. Um, and now we're up to two 250 um, meg pipes. So there's been a 5x uh, increase since the beginning of the school year. There was a new controller that was added, Audison, um, uh, over the um, break, had some problems with that, and uh, we'll be um, upgrading again uh, to fix those problems. Um, we've upgraded PowerSchool. Um, we configured and installed two caching servers to help with internet traffic. Um, we also have had a large um, volume of professional development. We continue to run twice a, a month technology study group meetings with representatives from all the schools in the district. Um, this is a professional learning community where teachers share best practices in the transformation of education through the use of technology. Susan Bisson um, also, who is our instructional technology and database specialist, provides classroom support for iPad initiatives across the district, assisted by Matt Paisano and Francis Dabara. Um, Susan has also been running before and after school training um, in the use of Baseline Edge, which is our technology tool for the Arlington Educational um, Evaluation System. And last but not least, we had a, a number of things that teachers went out of district, but probably, um, probably the most uh, noteworthy would be the 14 teachers who attended the International iPad Summit at the Heinz Convention Center earlier this winter. Um, as we told you before, two of our teachers, Anne-Marie Abbott and Nicole Melnick, presented at the conference to a packed room, and we recently received word that Susan Bisson and myself will be speaking um, at the leading future learning conference to be held at the Holy Cross College, sponsored by EdTech Teacher and MassQ, and we'll be presenting on the way we've used um, support structures at Thompson to successfully implement um, a one-to-one -one iPad environment, and uh, most key to that has been utilization of students um, to provide expertise in uh, the fourth and fifth grade student. Uh, Susan has trained 
um, fourth and fifth grade students to pr provide assistance in their classrooms to their teachers with the iPads. Yes. Um, have we got any indication from the state of how much bandwidth we, a, a community is going to need to, to, imp, uh, to use PARC? To use PARC, they've already been testing that we've done and um, a park is set up so that you can actually cache it, which means that you can actually bring it down and sort of hold it in memory mm -hmm. for students to go back and forth. But we have sufficient, we have more than sufficient bandwidth. I'm talking about the testing. Right. Mm -hmm. You can actually cache the park test. Mm -hmm. You my, can. Okay. I'm, I'm lacking knowledge on this. My understanding is the child will take the test, they hit return. It goes, gets corrected, and you get it back. Right, but when the questions come down, it doesn't have to be real time. It sort of can like, it's sort of like I, I, you, I, you give me information, I sort of hold it, yeah. and then when I'm all done with it, I send it back up, as opposed to question one, I send it down, you answer it. No issue question of, two. There, okay, there's no issue of security. No, it, that, I mean, that's one method of doing it, caching. We actually have enough bandwidth that we don't okay. need to. The second question, totally unrelated. I, I talked to you before, and I, I may not get this correct mm -hmm. the uh, local channels are coming up for uh, relicensing that's stuff. correct uh, are we anywhere? we're well aware that that it oftentimes when a community um, negotiates its cable contracts that there are elements of technology that the mm -hmm. district might receive in kind as no, part of no, that process it, it's clear they have to provide mm -hmm. us a certain percentage each one of them has to provide the community mm -hmm. now whether we get a piece of the pie or not, we're probably one of the bigger users uh, as a group in our budget and stuff like that. But I mean, I, I just would like us to be as aggressive as we can. We lost out to one of the uh, uh, cable companies the last time. There was uh, mm -hmm. the school lost out completely, RCN. Well, the town the, got a piece, but right, the we, we got nothing. The town manager is well aware of that and has discussed that as part. The town has a. Um, uh, technology strategic uh, committee and strategic plan that they're working at at the town level and that's one of the pieces that they're Are taking a look at. That? Yes, I, I sit on that committee as well as David Good who's mm -hmm. the instru um, chief instructional technology officer. David straddles the fence. So yes, I mean, he does his both sides. Is 50 50, so. I just well, sure. I meet with David every week Thursday. I, so. <laughs> I just want to make, our, our technology needs are uh, growing geometric. The town. That's correct has needs but they're nowhere near as much as we are we are we're outdated the day before we get it mm -hmm. uh, with our students going forward and, and things of that nature and, and thank you for saying that because you remind me of something else um, we have recently come to an agreement with the capital committee um, that there will be increased funding um, for particularly for teacher machines we have many many teachers about 280 teachers that are using machines that are five years or older um, and we've been working with the capital committee and have come to an agreement on the process that we will be able to expedite the upgrading of those machines. That's particularly um, important because of the changes in the teacher evaluation system and the necessity for teachers to be able to monitor at a, at a very rapid pace um, the data regarding their students' performance. Um, in addition, the capital committee has also seen fit to um, come to an agreement with us on allow, uh, providing us with some additional funding that will help us to get equity at the different schools, Thompson being set aside, but the other six elementary schools will have equity in terms of the technology that's available at those schools. Mr. You know, I just want to make, I just want to say something. I, you know, my experience with the IT department that, man, that works for both the town and the school departments, it, this works very well. And I think it has worked ex exceptionally well. I think they're fair to both sides yes. and trying to do what's best right. for both sides. So mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that mm -hmm. that's been my experience and my observation. Yeah, and that's been my experience as well. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Oh, Dr. Sure. Um, I had, had wanted to ask about the teachers who need the new, new computers. Can you talk about what expedited means? Does that mean this year, next year, in currently, a few years? It, currently it appears that we will be able to bring all teachers into the 21st century by the end of next fiscal year. By the end of 2015? Yeah, fiscal, in, the, in, the next school, in the next school year. Oh, wait. So next okay. for next school year, for the 2014-2015 okay. school year. By, by the end of that school year. Well, I, my hope is by the beginning of that school year. Okay, okay thank you. Mm -hmm. With regard to like the, the buying or purchasing of new um, hardware or software, um, 
ha has there been thought about leasing as opposed to buying? And, and what, are the, what are the pros and cons of, of each? Um, because things do get outdated pretty rapidly, mm -hmm. right? Um, there are a number of programs through the Apple um, company, uh, Apple Equity Leases. Um, Diane Johnson and I have looked into them uh, a few times. It depends on the district, which is more advantageous. I don't, we are meeting with the uh, sales rep from Apple on February 4th, and we'll be talking about that again. Okay. Currently, are we in any leases with anything? Not with any of our technology equipment, just our copying machines. Uh -huh. Is that something that the cable companies could help us with? If, if we work something out, my understanding was it's not only hardware, mm -hmm. but uh, it does not have to be directly related to their, their function. Oh, oh, I see what you're saying. I, um, I, 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 I don't, that wouldn't come up until their, their contract was up, and I think we, it has at least another year, right? I, I, I guess you know better how to do it. I apologize if it sounds like I'm trying to tell you your job, but to be prepared with, the, with for a better phrase, mm -hmm. a list and, and understand, I don't understand exactly what they required to provide, but what was expressed to me, it does not have to be just within the realm of their cable of their company. Cable company. It, right. it, it's, a, it's a dollar amount right. that they, they're required to borrow a percentage. The capital committee required, and I provided them with a three-year replacement cycle, four-year replacement cycle um, that goes out to 2019, fiscal year 2019. So we have a long-term plan in terms of a dollar amount. Um, I also want to follow up. Um, I know you were present at the Audison OPAC meeting um, and heard from some of that some of the teachers find that the shift from having printers versus now going to a copier, a, a copier acting as the printer, so it's in one location, the teacher, teachers have to go, are finding that somewhat onerous. And I'm wondering. What I, I appreciate that we're trying to save money, but we also need to be evaluating how well does the setup work mm -hmm. and how are we evaluating that? How are you going back and checking with the users whether this new method is working? We have technology, uh, as I said, we have a technology study group and there are technology representatives in each school and they come and they meet with us mm -hmm. twice a month and that's one of the things that we've been discussing. So that's how we get feedback from the schools. So we'll be presenting, I mean, we're about halfway through our first year and I, of implementation, and there were a, a number of technical problems at the beginning of the school year. So I think we're into about two months worth of it being settled down and the, all the technical problems being um, resolved, particularly at the elementary schools that have Macintosh machines. We had some Apple machines. We had some um, cards that had to be gotten for the, for the high-speed printers, et cetera, um, because that's what those copy machines really are. Is they mm -hmm. fax, they scan, right. they do it all. Um, so we'll have better um, idea about how, where the problems lie and, m and maybe where we might have to put, you know, one co uh, printer or another printer. Mm -hmm. But as I discussed at the OPAC meeting, the cost of ink cartridges mm -hmm. is outrageous. Mm -hmm. And if you, if you look at what, I mean, it's almost half a teacher, what we would spend on ink cartridges. I know, but we're not making any extra time for our teachers either so you know the cost to them there there is a cost if they're having to to walk around right so we so have to look at the cost benefit analysis right. right and my so my question is are we actually I, I understand that the tech representatives are reporting but we actually surveying or or talking to the teachers all the teachers who are using this not just the tech representatives i mean are we going to do a survey well, we could. That's a good suggestion. Okay, That's not you. something we, we count on them to bring us information, but perhaps we should do um, a, a, a survey for all of them. We've done similar surveys for other things, so that would be a good okay. suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. Can we just say something about the, the, the cartridges are very expensive, um, and there are needs for some teachers to have printers. Mm -hmm and the cartridges come out of the principal's budget. Mm -hmm. So if a, we're not micromanaging mm -hmm. these schools, if a, if a, if a mm -hmm. principal wants to spend money on cartridges, we're not saying no to that. Mm -hmm. So that, that's an issue now. The mm -hmm. question will be is when a particular printer dies, whether that's something that we will continue to invest in. And I think that there'll be a lot of uh, protocol, uh, not protocols, but sort of guidelines as to, you know, whether we would do that or not. 
Um, so it is the, the, the one advantage of these new systems is that you have a code that you put in. So you, you do maintain s security around your materials. I think that was a, a worry mm -hmm. that that wouldn't be the case, but that isn't the case. Um, and so it's, uh, right now we, uh, we main, right now we had, we believe we have sufficient number of copiers in, lo in convenient locations because when we went into this copier arrangement, um, actually it was done very thoughtfully in terms of trying to figure out exactly how many we needed. And Audison in particular got um, additional ones because they w it was totally, the, the, the previous system number was not workable. So we'll see. We'll see how it, it evolves. Um, but when you, d but it is a, an expense, and as people, you know, have to yeah. make decisions about their priorities, that'll be that'll figure into it. Thank you. Well, I mean, I, I, I we, we've got this set up in the school where I'm at, and it and it works very well for us. Mm -hmm. Now, obviously, we're a small geographic space, so it's not that far from any classroom to where the printer is located. And that, that might be an issue, but there's a lot more, you know, the, the qualities are higher uh, quality. Mm -hmm. um, if you scan something, you know, you're not running to the machine to make photocopies. If you've got a PDF, you can just run that right out from your computer and not stand at the copier. Mm -hmm. uh, there, you know, once people get used to this, and once teachers take their um, source material that they use repeatedly, scan it and have a file, I think they're going to find this setup to be uh, something that they really like. Uh, it, it, you know, there are, of course, benefits and minuses versus having a, a printer, you know, right next to your desk. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean, the printers are cheap, but the cartridges are very expensive. The quality isn't as good, and and they're slow relative to uh, what what this machine will do. Right. So, you know, um, it, it seems like a good move to me. The, the issue of printers uh, for a teacher is that if they have a quick copy you want to run off, it's just fine. Mm -hmm. But if you have, like at the middle school, you have uh, 120 students and you're running off the same handout, mm -hmm. you don't want to do it on your printer mm -hmm. when the, the cost is so much more effective on a, and higher quality, I might add, too, on, a, on one of these Xerox machines. Yeah. And you don't want to print a copy and then have to stand at the copier. This is this exactly. You can just send. You can mm -hmm. send it out because most people com, com, you know, create these on um, yeah. their own computer and they send it out. Mm -hmm. Or even if you didn't, you can still scan it and do it. Yeah. Yeah. And keep the scan and use it again. That's right. The scanned copy goes immediately to your email. Mm -hmm. And I just want to say this is goal three point one: teaching and learning will improve <laughs> with implementation of phase one of the technology. <laughs> plan. Yeah. How many phases are there going to be? Of the technology plan, um, right now there's three. Um, uh, we're going. We're going. Well, it's not like it sort of ends. It's sort of when we get to phase three, we'll have a baseline, and then we'll be moving into. Um, hopefully, technology won't go through the hoop it's gone through in the last three or four years, but I'm not really counting on that. Um, but we would hope that we would be in a replacement cycle as opposed to um, initial purchase cycle. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact. Um, we are well ahead of where we would have been, where we expected to be, and uh, through the work we've done with the capital committee, um, we'll be almost a year and a half ahead when we, if, if what happens, that what we expect to happen for the, the com upcoming school year for next year. Great. And Siobhan Foley's here, <laughs> folks. She's been here for two hours from the AEA. <laughs> well, it's Welcome, yeah. Siobhan. Yeah. I was going to introduce you right at the end of our meeting, but <laughs> I won't do that. I've been kicking him under the table. That's all I have. <laughs> That's all you have. Okay, um, and I know that you've been working not only on the district goals, as you've been reporting out periodically, but on the superintendent's own personal goals about visiting the schools. Could mm -hmm. you just speak a little bit to that? I know it wasn't on our agenda specifically, but I know mm -hmm. you, you, we talked a little bit about that, the, the visiting of the... Uh, I have, I, it's, there are nine schools, and I have been out visiting um, the different schools, but when I go to a particular school, um, initially I started doing more walk, walk arounds, but that just seemed more of a meet and greet. And so what I um, have been doing more recently in the last couple months, really, is really only going to visiting a couple of classrooms in a school. Mm -hmm. And um, 
so I may not see every teacher in the building, I, but I'm going to try to balance that a little bit more and trying to, mm -hmm. to see people. Um, it's a challenge. It's a challenge. It's an off. You know, my days are awfully very busy, and it's. it's but I, I, I usually try to get there first thing because once I get back, getting out is really tough. Mm -hmm. So, that's that's pretty much the. We can talk more about that um, in in March if you want when we. We, we look at that those goals but yes but one of my other ones had to do with um, you know achievement which has to which we really won't be able to take a look at until we get into next year the MCAS dates have been announced, MCAS. right mm -hmm. they, they're, they're announced all the schools have their MCAS dates already oh yes yeah. we have and the thing to know about MCAS dates they're usually MCAS windows mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in here in Arlington, I think as most districts do, you we don't have all of the elementary on the same day because uh, a number, in order to be able to sort of have the all hands on deck kind of uh, approach, that we need people to come in and do accommodations, mm -hmm. and so we might be bringing some people from one school over to help. Um, I, I think that we're doing that a little bit less now than we've had to do it in the past because we now have, for example, a social worker in every school and with the way we've restructured in the last uh, few years. But the um, so, but we we generally do stagger those so that we can uh, do accommodations. The the middle school and the high school that is not as much of an issue, um, and and in fact, the high school has set dates. Uh, we have windows otherwise. What is also we have now are the park schedule, mm -hmm. and those are also windows uh, that will the students will be taking the test. And we've already gone through the process um, of I think the, th the principals have selected the just the about not for the middle school, not middle, middle school. school. Yeah, but pretty much the element. Well, we we just have Dallin and Thompson, and um, Bishop. Mm -hmm. Bishop selecting which classroom. So if you if you're supposed to have two classrooms, for example, a Dallin and this four in a grade or three in a grade, you have to randomly pull the names and then we upload all that data. So we're in the process of selecting the classes, uploading the data so we're ready to go. Mm -hmm. On the evaluation itself, the actual classroom teachers, is that responsibility to the principal? The evaluation of the teacher at the elementary school level, 99% of them is the principal. At the middle school and the high school level, many, many of those teachers are evaluated by their department chairs, but but they have multiple observations, no, and some that. of those observations are done by the principal. Thank you. Mr. Schlickman. Yeah, just while we're on the topic of windows, uh, we're in a mass tell window as well. Mm -hmm. um, I know that it, uh, at least one school in our district didn't hit the 50% threshold last time and didn't report. Uh, do we have something in place to make sure that all our schools hit, hit the 50%? The, the letters were sent out to the mm -hmm. principals and, um, and then a couple of days later the, the superintendents in the, in the Commonwealth were notified that, that happened, mm -hmm. an issue. Um, but they, they were, and, mm. and I think most of our schools have some meeting planned where they're going to be distributed. They're, they've asked not to put them in the mailboxes. And they have a fairly w wide window mm -hmm. in order to, um, to respond. Mm -hmm. yeah, and I, I know the AEA sure is a... Participation to get data. I, I will say one, I, well, mm -hmm. sometimes I think, I don't, I don't know what the data on this, I think a lot of teachers started it, but it's a mm -hmm. very long survey. And uh, I don't know how, what percentage, but we didn't have um, a full, we, mm -hmm. we only had a few schools that made the 50% mark mm -hmm. last time. I think, it's, I think it's important data so that anything we can do to encourage, and for the AEA folks, if, if you all encourage your members to go and do this, it, it is totally anonymous. Thank you. And uh, you know, it's, it's important for us to, to know what's happening out there. We want to hear their voices. Right. Um, Linda Hansen, our president, has actually already sent out um, notification about the, this coming up and that they should have, that teachers should all be asking their principals for um, the, I think it's an access code, mm -hmm. in order to get into it. Um, and also building reps have been um, asked to have a 10 minute meeting to um, personally encourage all of the teachers to to enter in this data because the union definitely does support teachers getting their input into the mass tells. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Can someone explain Dr. what Allison that is? 
Um, how can parents find out what the MCAS windows are in the park schedule? Um, the MCAS windows for the elementary school uh, will be decided, the specific ones for each school will be decided um, at the next elementary principals meeting. So, because uh, I knew you had sent me an email, there was a parent that wanted to specifically know for that school. So not so much the window, but the actual testing date for that school. And that will be decided at the next element, elementary principals meeting, which will be in February, and then we'll post it on the website. Um, and for the park testing, once we've got a definitive which classrooms are gonna be tested, then we'll put that up on the website too. Um, I, asked, I also have to sit down with tech and work out a uh, number of our schools are doing it online. So we have to work out when we're gonna be rotating those kids into the different computer labs or putting the iPad cart in the room and we have to have a big enough room. So there's some details yet to be worked out. Um, so in terms of park, I would imagine that it will be around the same time frame, the first week in February. Okay, thank you. Okay. Real quickly, Ms. Hines. Um, very quickly. I'm just wondering if either Dr. Chesson, Ms. Chesson or Dr. Berger would um, talk a little bit about what the MassTel survey mm -hmm. is for those that are not as familiar mm -hmm. with alphabet mm -hmm. soup as we are. Mm -hmm. It's a survey um, that has been designed to get teacher feedback, actually administrative feedback as well, um, on a whole range of topics, um, including culture, professional development, um, curriculum, um, everything involved with a practice, and um, could be even the, the facilities, in terms of the, st the, the kinds of, if you have everything that you need in a particular classroom and your, your opportunities to be a teacher leader, um, it's just, it's, it's a full range, but it is a very, it is a very, in fact, it's 25 pages long. They give it every year? Um, they give it every other year. Huh. I've never heard of it before. I wasn't, you should be taking it. Year. You I should know. be taking it, yeah. <laughs> never heard of it. What, when are the, res when are the results reported out? There is, once they completed, I think it's February 17th is the last date that the window is open. And then there's a period, I don't know when they're gonna make it available, but there'll be a two week window in which schools and districts, um, teachers can look at it. And then there's a, then it becomes public. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Bodie, Dr. Chesson for updating us on those issues and topics. Consent agenda, I move all items listed with an asterisk are to be considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There'll be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant 14096 dated January 9th, 2014 in the amount of $592,416.37. Proof of draft minutes, none. May I have a second? Second. Discussion, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed against? All right, moving on, please. Subcommittee and liaison reports, policies and procedures. Mr. Thielman. We meet on January 27th, Monday at 7 p.m. and Rebecca Bryant will be here and I am conscious of Mr. Hainer's request to try to get information before the meeting and I'll try to do that. Thank you. Let's Ms. Phelps, 7 p.m. 7 p.m., um, 7 p.m. We have had two uh, budget meetings over the last couple weeks. Um, the first one was about the FY15 budget and how it's shaping up, um, just talking about uh, kind of what about what we're looking at. Um, it looks like given the money we have, we're gonna be able to probably grant about half of, of the requests that we have heard um, from the principals and the department heads, mm -hmm. um, which is always better than telling them they have to cut. So, um, you know, I know it's mm -hmm. not everything everybody wanted, but I, I think it, I, I, was, I was very optimistic. Um, I'm also optimistic because it really does kind of follow a lot of the priorities that came from us. I think that, you know, I feel like we were heard and I feel that that means that people in town were heard um, and obviously the principals and department heads were heard. Um, so, um, you know, I think that you'll see that um, and uh, so we're just moving forward with that. There's nothing obviously to share mm -hmm. tonight. We're just still working that through. Um, and the other piece that the budget uh, subcommittee is working on is the um, restructuring the formula for how we rent space to long-term renters, which are basically our after-school programs. Um, 
and making sure that that's equitable for all of the after school programs and that there is reasoning behind the numbers and not just like someone grabbed a number out of the air. So um, we are working on having a uh, motion. Uh, it will probably require us to modify one of the um, uh, policy, thank you, the word I was looking for, policies. Uh, we have a policy on rentals, uh, rental that we worked on forever, I believe, a couple <laughs> years ago. It took us forever to come up with that. Anyway, well, it looks like what we're going to probably end up doing is adding another um, layer of rental on that. So um, hopefully we'll have that mm -hmm. for our next school committee meeting. And our next budget meeting will be held on Thursday, February 6th at 6.30 p.m., where we will hopefully wrap up some of that stuff so we have it for the next meeting. Mm -hmm. So you don't envision any discarding the whole policy, but just maybe adding on. No, no, yes. no. I think that what we need is just for for long term renters. There was no, there was really no place for that. Like we we came up with, and we I think it was very thoughtful of you know, this gymnasium costs this much, but if you're someone who rents it every day for 180 days, well, mm -hmm. we wanted to make sure that we had a formula for how that was going to be rented out, and so that's that's kind of I think so. What we're going to do is kind of just amend that policy. Mm -hmm. Okay, any questions then? All right, moving on. Ms. Hyatt, come in here. Okay, uh, curriculum instruction assessment and accountability, Dr. Allison. Um, we'll be scheduling a meeting, hopefully before our next meeting to discuss the athletic handbook. We've gotten information from town council to uh, move forward. Oh. Yeah. And the program of studies too for the high school. Yes. I had heard that loop through, but I hadn't heard it directly. Okay, so. Um, uh, so, so yeah, so we can discuss the program of studies also, but we'll need to have it supplied. I haven't seen it yet. Right. When do you think we might be supplied with emails from Dr. Oh, I, I sent a, a couple of dates um, that we could possibly do it and that th that would work for uh, Dr. Janger and uh, Bill McCarthy, the high school. So no, no. is it for us to review that the, the, the document. material? The actual yes. Thing. Well, I think that they have finished all the edits on it, and you can see. I think, as I said to Mr. Hayner, I w I'd rather have it sent to you electronically because then you can see the the edits, mm -hmm. the and you'll new the, text. the new text. Whereas if I, if I do it by paper, it'll come no. different gray, but you won't get the full mm -hmm. uh, all the different passages. There were some <coughs> things that we needed to to amend in terms of policy, but I think the and some of it's just simply wording as well, um, some improvements. But then the I think the most important thing is looking at what the new offerings are going to be and the rationale for those. So, okay. when do you so think we're going to be able to? Uh, let me talk to them tomorrow and see if it's ready to go. Okay. And even if it's not, you could see where we are and you can tell you where there's some changes. There's no reason why you can't have it. It's right. So I'm just trying to make sure I understand what's going on. So. Our subcommittee is going to need to review that to to mm -hmm. before the next have, meeting, which yeah. is fine. Did I didn't understand about the scheduling dates? Do you do you want Dr. Jenger also to be at the subcommittee meeting? I mean, do I need? They need to be there. With they do need to be there. That's why I gave a, a couple of times that would work for him. And if those don't work for the committee, then we can go into the next week. But we we really want to get this approved at the subcommittee with a recommendation because um, it's important that they begin the registration process. Right. I think I've, I didn't get an email, so oh. yeah, that, that's why I'm oh. like, I'm oh, out of this loop. Yeah, okay. yeah, no, that's, I have not gotten anything on this, so mm -hmm. that's, okay, so maybe you can resend that stuff and I'll look for it and if I don't get it tomorrow, I'll call. Could, when you send out the, the scheduling thing to the subcommittee, why don't we just add their names to it? Well, if she's already got dates, I want to see what they are first. I already have dates. Okay, talk yep. about that after. Okay, great. Anything else? Facilities? Nothing at this time. Okay, I would like to just say that I've been approached by uh, a certain principal at the middle school about possibly having all of us tour with him mm -hmm. in the middle school. I don't have a middle school student. I know we did that with the high school recently. I would like the opportunity to maybe doodle out to all of you uh, some time, some dates, mm -hmm. that maybe we could uh, we could do that as a group. I think that would be a nice, uh, a nice thing to do. Is the purpose to look at the facility? Look at the facility, look at the space, look mm -hmm. at the curriculum, mm -hmm. um, you know, where, 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 look at the curriculum, not, look not at the, the curriculum. curriculum. The, the, the physical space, okay. mm -hmm. yeah. 
Mm -hmm. Right, because I know that a lot of folks okay. in the town have been talking about that size mm -hmm. of school. Um, so great, and I yes, I would like to recognize uh, the vice chair uh, for a brief moment about something very exciting in his life. On February 1st, uh, some people say I'm insane, some people think I'm well insane. I'm doing a, what's called a polar plunge for mm -hmm. polio. I will be running into the Atlantic Ocean uh, at high tide at noon on Saturday. I would, uh, I'm doing this again for polio, raising money for it. If you're inclined, uh, I am soliciting, please just email me. Uh, I'm on the school committee's uh, website and I will uh, connect you with the actual web page uh, to do that. Mm -hmm. And if you pledge, Mr. Hanner, he promises to, what, it, what do you promise I to said uh, a $25 pledge gets pictures, a $50 picture gets no pictures. <laughs> Thank you. That's exciting. No, and thank you for doing this. Mm -hmm. um, all right, secretary's report. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, we have received the following correspondence since our last meeting. A letter from parent Katie Coughlin requesting the reconsideration of materials form submission following up email asking about the request and a response from Ms. Coughlin from Dr. Chesson. Um, email announcing a draft revised science and technology engineering curriculum for Massachusetts from the PESE. Emails from Dr. Bodie on the commissioner's weekly update for both January 10th, 2014 and January 17th, 2014. Email from Dr. Bodie informing us of a book drive led by Pierce fifth graders to help restore some of the books lost due to the water damage. Email from Dr. Bodie about the delayed opening of schools on Wednesday, January 22nd due to snow. Email from Karen Fitzgerald following up with documents on buffer zones from the last meeting. Email from Karen to Sony about a student assembly at Audison, which I was held today, which we heard all about at 8.30 about navigating the cyber world. We were all invited. Uh, we all received two Magic Treehouse books by mm -hmm. author Mary Pope Osborne sent by Andrea Shea to ensure that all school committee members had read and seen the series. Uh, December invoices from Stoneham Chandler and Miller in Excel format for school committee review. Email from Hardy parent Stacy Smith in support of the Tools of the Mind curriculum, and email from Hardy kindergarten parent Jen Mulligan with pros and cons of mm. Tools of the Mind mm. curriculum for kindergartners. That's thank it. you, and thank you for taking notes this evening, Miss. No, I'm trying. Mm -hmm. My computer's going to die soon, so <laughs> okay, we need we, to end. <laughs> we just have a very brief thing to discuss in executive session. Okay, dokie. So I'd like to make a motion to move into executive session to conduct strategy session, sessions in pre preparation for negotiations with union and or non-union personnel.